Uh, you can see which side of the Star Wars and Star Trek debate, debate I fall on. Um, I'm going to pick up from this conversation and say that in order to understand how to provide information to the world's most vulnerable people, we also have to know where they are. And that if we look at the type of innovation that's happening in San Francisco or in many of the tech hubs around the world, we are often cutting our legs off before we even start. We are, we've created a capital system where we're innovating against the labor market. Like we're innovating against labor. We're not innovating against good problems. And by doing that, we stop our ability in its tracks to actually solve some of those interesting problems. So I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about how a team in New York is doing exactly that. We sit inside of a big organization. UNICEF is something I didn't know very much about before I joined it, but it is huge. It is global. It works with every government uh, in the world to advocate for and promote the rights of the world's most vulnerable children. It is also the world's largest purchaser of pencils. Um, <laughs> but that market, that market positioning, the fact that we buy so much vaccine, allows us to do things that a smaller NGO often doesn't have the access or the capacity to do, which is really set global policy. Um, we are lucky that we have a team of incredibly diverse and strange nerds in New York. Uh, this is the team that I come from. And we look at investing in technologies that are open source, that are coming from emerging markets, and that are trying to solve some of the world's biggest problems. Uh, here are five things that keep us up at night. By 2050, 75% of people are going to live in cities where all problems are compounded in a multidimensional manner. Right now, in 2018, we've got 55 million children on the move because of war or violence. 55 million kids who don't have access to a government or a home. And when you live in a paradise, you have to think about what happens when 10 million people come knocking on your door. We live in a world that's been destroyed. And hopefully we can pick some of that up. But right now we have a situation where 400 million kids don't have access to the right food or nutrition because there's either too much water on their land or not enough. Jack Ma said the next 30 years of human history are filled with more pain and suffering than with joy. I hope that's not true, but he's super smart. Um, and how do we look at a, at a complex set of interactions like this that are also beset by the fact that now a disease moves more quickly from one place to another than it ever has before and have any hope? So those are all the depressing things. But our team tries to look at some of these technologies and some of these emergences and see how we can actually turn them to solve these big issues that keep us up at night. Uh, here is the Amazon. There will be some analogies here that I will not have time to draw. Amazon is a part of a country that's very wealthy, but Amazon itself is very poor. It's far away, and it's hard to move around the Amazon uh, if you're not in the capital city of Manaus. If you're just a few hours out, if you're half an hour out by airplane, you're probably three to four hours away from your school, and you take a school boat every day to get there. Three hours back, three hours there, six hours of your day is spent traveling. It's an area that is very disconnected from the modernity of Sao Paulo or Brasilia. And it's also an area where you have kids like these who are using materials that aren't made for them. Those kids are learning about language, but they're looking at apples and skyscrapers which don't exist in the Amazon. So they are not learning. And it's a place that is disconnected from the environment around it. This is amazing. In the, in the Amazon, the government has set up a distance learning center. So they're now providing two-way education to something like 60,000 students around the Amazon by satellite dish, right? That's great. So these kids are actually able to learn from content that's created in their region, in their language, with materials that they can use. But in order to do something like that, you need to know where those students are. You need to know where the information poverty is the greatest. You can't just put a solution in and expect that you're putting it in the right place. So with this position between a small venture fund and a big international organization, we've started to look at how we can turn technology to answer that question. Where are the needs the greatest? This is Mauritania. It is a country. Countries are fake. You can see that it's a country and that it's fake because it has straight lines, right? You don't find straight lines in nature. If you're hiking and you get lost, you follow the straight line because a human made it, right? So some white guy 100 years, 200 years ago drew those lines in Europe. That is not a real construct. Don't get fooled into thinking that it is. But if I ask you where are the schools in Mauritania, you'd say, I don't know. They're probably not in the desert. If we use data and we use some of the investments we've made through our venture fund, let's look at Mauritania through data. Here's a country, and you'll see some small white triangles. Those are cell towers, and there's some dots that are schools. Look at that. There's Mauritania. Now you can start to answer the question of where the schools are. And the interesting thing here is the schools are colored by how much cell phone access they have. The red, well, the, the gold schools, there are a few gold schools that have 3G connectivity. They've got Wi-Fi. They're happy, happy kids. They've got good information poverty, no information poverty. Blue schools have 2G. You can get an SMS in and out. The red schools have no connectivity at all. There is no way to get information in or out, but that's also a business. 
That's a business potential and that's a government need. So our fund and our work tries to look at investing in companies that can fill these gaps. Um, we're super lucky to have the capital to do these non-dilutional investments, these investments in open source technology, but also to look at spaces and parts of the technology landscape that we think are solving some of the world's most intractable problems. Um, and those include the frontier technologies that we're all inspired by, but focused at the places in the world where we know need the most help. Happy to discuss that more with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.